This broadcast is brought to you by Colby Brooks with Century 21 Right Pace Real Estate and buyfrombrooks.com. Let Colby Brooks handle all of your real estate needs. Coming up next on NEA Report, we're talking to our favorite reporter and author, George Jared, live about several different subjects, big stuff in the news lately. Talkbusiness.net just came out with new polling data that shows Joe Biden within reaching and possibly winning distance of Donald Trump in Arkansas for the 2020 election. Now, polls can be, well, finicky, and we know that, and we'll talk about that and much more related to the election coming up in just a short time. And then George and I will talk about the protests that have been taking place nationwide, the movement that is Black Lives Matter, and they do, but also the goal of the protest. Is it police reform? Is it more? We'll talk about all of this next. A couple of great conversations are coming up. Let's spend the evening together right here on NEA Report. Now, Stan Morris reporting. Thanks, everybody, for joining us on NEA Report. This is Stan Morris, joined tonight live by our friend George Jarrett, who's the author and journalist that works at Talk Business and Politics, but you've probably read some of his books that he's covered numerous different notorious crimes in across Northeast Arkansas. Uh, those are available. You can get them online on Amazon and other outlets. George, thanks for joining us tonight. Appreciate you for taking a little bit of time to, to step in with us to talk about some stuff. Thanks for having me, Stan. I'm glad to be here. Man, we've been talking a little bit about the 2020 presidential election, and uh, in our conversations that we've had, that's one that you brought up to me that you thought it deserved more attention than it was getting here in, in Arkansas. Uh, recent poll numbers that we've seen, uh, actually conducted by, by your outlet, uh, showed some startling stuff. Tell us a little bit about, about what you guys found out and uh, what the landscape looks like. Well, you know, Stan, in the 2016 election, Donald Trump won the state of Arkansas with 60% of the votes cast. And so he's always, this has been considered a ruby red state by just about every pollster and pundit in the country. And, um, you know, of course, my company, Talk Business and Politics, we have done polling in the state for years. Um, you know, Roby Brock and uh, Dr. Uh, Jay Barth down at Hendricks College. I mean, they're considered kind of the gold standard of pollsters in the state of Arkansas. Uh, they were the first to correctly predict that the first district of Arkansas would flip in 2010 um, to the Republican Rick Crawford. And, you know, this district had not gone to a Republican since Reconstruction. So that was very shocking. In fact, I remember at the time I was working at the Jonesboro Sun and I called Roby when the poll came out in June of 2010. And I said, there is no way that Rick Crawford has a nine point lead over Chad Causey in that race. And he he said, that's what our polling is telling us. So they've always, they've always had a very good track record. And in this recent poll that was dropped on Sunday, they showed that Donald Trump was at 47% in the state, and they showed that Joe Biden was 45, with five undecided. And um, at first you'd say, well, maybe that's an outlier poll, you know, um, and that's entirely possible. It's just a snap. Polls are not predictors. They're snapshots in time. So, but there's some other things in the poll that you can kind of glean out of it that may that seem to make make me believe that it's actually a pretty good poll for or a good snapshot for this time frame. And one of those numbers is the fact that uh, Asa Hutchinson, you know, he has a, his job approval rating according to the poll was about 62 percent, something in that range, and that's pr that's pretty high. And usually when Asa's at his most popular, that's where he's at. So the same people who uh, only 47% of the poll said that they are going to vote for Donald Trump, 45 said they're going to vote for Joe Biden, and 62% of those people said that Asa Hutchinson is doing a good job. So as of right now, kind of the what we're seeing in the national trend lines is actually bleeding into Arkansas. You know, some interesting stuff. I'm looking at the poll results on the screen and not something that I would have actually expected. Uh, George, you know that this has been an unusual few years for that matter. I guess a, a, we may say now uh, two election seasons, if, if you will, maybe three. But uh, to see that Joe Biden in this poll is 2% behind Mr. Trump in Arkansas, it's a little bit surprising. Do you? Why is that? Why do you think that is? Well, I think it's actually a number of things. Um, it, it's kind of like, you know, we, we've had this COVID crisis going on for the last several months. 
And it's not even um, not you're not blaming anybody. It's nobody's fault that this virus, to, you know, turned into a global pandemic and shut our economy down. But as a general rule, you know, if people are not making as much money, if their lives are not as happy, they tend to blame incumbents when it comes into an election cycle. You know, typically an incumbent doesn't really do better the se- during their second run, White House run in that regard. We've also had all this, you know, this uh, this racial tension, all the protests and the riots that have been going on the last several weeks. And there's a certain there's a certain voting block that has been energized by this. And it's it's a, a voting block that will support Joe Biden. So it's not surprising that uh, Biden would do be, would be doing better here than, let's say, Hillary Clinton did in 2016 mm. or Barack Obama did in 12. But it is shocking that they're so close. That's the thing. It's not even that he's doing that well. Because I think Al Gore only lost the state by like four. So it's not out of the realm of possibility the Democrat could be competitive here. But it's just surprising how poorly uh, President Trump is doing at this moment. It really is surprising, but you know, you brought up something about how things are being energized right now for, I mean, just to be honest, the people on the left more so than anybody, the more progressive uh, type thinkers. But so here's my question for you. Are they going to stay energized enough to actually get out and vote or are they going to burn out by the time next week rolls around and be on their couches in November? What do you actually think they will follow through? Because that's the issue with people on the left, right? Turnout seems to be the big issue. Well, I will say this, Stan, um, most, like the, most of the polling that's being done now is among uh, people who are likely to vote, meaning that they've probably voted in at least the last two elections. And I can tell you from personal experience, once you start voting, you vote. I mean, I have voted in every election, you know, since I was in high school. Um, so I can say that, you know, polling likely voters is a, a much more accurate way of doing it than just polling, like, let's say, registered voters. Because like you said, some of those people stay on their couch and don't show up. I will say this. Um, a few weeks ago, there's, there's kind of like three metrics that three, the, three of the metrics political scientists use to try to gauge where a race is are polling, the Vegas betting odds, and the congressional generic ballot. And a few weeks ago, uh, the betting odds were overwhelmingly in favor of Donald Trump being reelected even though his polling numbers were uh, significantly lower than Joe Biden's on a national level. And the congressional generic ballot was, a, was around about 4% plus Democrat, which is pretty good for Democrats, but you know, it's not uh, indica- indicative of, of a landslide. Well, the thing about it is, is when you have Biden's poll numbers here and you have Trump's uh, are, uh, betting odds like to his favor here, there's a lot of fluidity in a race like that. You see, you see what I'm saying? Well, what's happened in the last uh, couple of weeks is those three numbers are starting to line up right next to each other. And what that can indicate is there's a hardening within the electorate, meaning that people have made up their minds about how they're going to vote, and it's not likely to change. Now, it could change. I'm not saying that. It's still June. But you've got the poll numbers are at 8.1% to Biden's advantage. The congressional generic ballots at 82 and Stan, why that's important is because generally when you get a generic ballot that's plus five or more, you're looking at a wipeout for the other for the other uh, party. And what I mean by that is, and I'll give you an example. So in 2010, the generic ballot going into the election was plus six Republican. They won 63 House seats that election cycle, which was unbelievable. Wow. So, and the Democrats are at 8.2 as we sit here right now. The polls at 8.1 and the betting odds are at 9.3 plus Biden. So those numbers are all lining up. So to me, and here's the thing, and I'll say this, my favorite of all three are the Vegas betting odds. And the reason is, is because gamblers don't care who wins. It's not an emotional decision for them. They use hard data to come to their conclusions. And when I saw the betting line move almost 19 points in two and a half to three weeks, I thought, wow, something is really changing in their data sets. Let me talk to you a little bit since we're talking about polls. I've been showing on the screen um, the uh, general election poll from Real Clear Politics right now. The current one between Biden and Trump shows Biden ahead uh, by about eight points. I think that's what you had yeah. said. It's uh, about an eight or nine point lead right now. Um, I want to look at the polls that we saw back during the uh, 
the 2016 election between Trump and Hillary. Um, because as you know, the polls then showed that Trump was going to lose. And that didn't happen, as we all should know by now. Um, some more painfully than others. So the question is, are we going to see the same thing? Or is this different this time? And, and I want you to explain what is different between these two. Now, I'm going to, before we get into that part, I want to say we're in June right now. So let's go back to June during the uh, the period of the polls that showed Trump at 38%, Hillary at 44%. And sure, those numbers aren't as large as they are with Biden now, but a lot can still happen, right? I mean, you, you, can't, you can't look at that and not kind of think to yourself, oh yeah, <laughs> right? What do you think? Tell me where you're at. Okay, well, first, the first thing I'll say is, is that the, the national polling in that race, the, the, the Clinton-Trump uh, race in 2016, was dead on. She ended up with 3 million more votes than him in that race. So the national polling was fine. The national polls all fell with, easily within the margin of error. What happened was, is there was three states in the upper Midwest, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Those three states, President Trump won by a grand total of 77,000 votes. In the state of Michigan, he won the state of Michigan by 0.2% against Clinton. So he, he only, it was 11,000 vote difference. So even if you look at any poll, the, the margin of error for any poll is gonna be anywhere from three to four and a half points. And there's a simple reason for that, Stan. A person can tell a pollster, I'm gonna vote a certain way, but by the time they get in the booth, they might have changed their mind. And it happens, sure. and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a, actually a predictable phenomenon, and it's usually about 3 to 4%. And um, I tell people all the time, you know, when they, when they talk about the fact that the polls were wrong in 2016, I say, yes, they, uh, they were to a degree, but they were still within the margin of error. And here's the thing. Donald Trump's own pollsters told him he was going to lose. I mean, it's not. He didn't write a victory speech that night, and that's been well documented. He was he was very reserved that night, thinking he was going to lose, and then he won those three states by the skin of his teeth, and he was elected president. So I would say the biggest difference between then and now, it's not just the margin between Biden and Trump. Trump always hangs around between 38 and 44. He'll he'll fluctuate in that range. He has his entire presidency ever since he started running. The difference here now is, and if you look at that top number for Biden, what is it, 49.8 or 49.9? It's, yep, yep. it's 49.8. That number is critical because, you, as you said before, where was Hillary at? She was at 44. Hillary Clinton was a known quantity. People already had opinion about her. They've had opinions about her for years, years before she ever ran for president, good or bad. So when she's at 44%, that means that all those undecided people out there they already had made up their mind about her. And typically, and this is always the case, if there's two, if you have to choose between two candidates that you feel like are a bad choice, you're going to go with the lesser known quantity because it's, it's just a phenomenon in voting and in, in politics. So all, and that, and the, and the exit polling in 2016 bared that out of independent voters who decided in the last 10 days of the election, 67% voted for Donald Trump. And here's the yeah. other thing I'll say, and this, I have a suspicion this is true, and I'm glad we're recording this. So a year from now, you can bring me back on and make fun of me for being <laughs> wrong, or you can praise me for being right. Who knows, right? No, I'll um, just edit that out. I have this, right, right. <laughs> Lose that tape. Uh, but I have a suspicion that we are so polar. Donald Trump is such a polarizing figure that people have made up their minds. Most of the people have made up their minds now. There's not going to be a big sea change around Labor Day, around October, because that's how this cycle usually works, is we start off in June, we have our two candidates decided, then we go through the summer, not a lot happens, you know, they go on vacation, they take all those ridiculous, silly pictures and send them out to all of us and annoy the crap out of us on social media. But then around Labor Day, when everybody's back at work and back at school, that's when people start really paying attention. I think in this case, it's different. I think that people are paying attention now. And I think that those decisions, those hard decisions being made now, and I'll tell you, there's some tells out there, especially on the uh, on the Trump side of it, because he's really wanting to get back into campaign mode. And it's I'm not saying it's uncommon for uh, candidates to have a lot of rallies in the summer. They do have rallies. 
But I'm, President Trump, he, he wants to go out and rally like every day. And so he feels like that that will energize his base. But he's going to have to at some point, he's going to have to get some independence to come back to him. Um, I'm looking at some of the favorability numbers and Donald Trump's numbers right now, favorability wise, they're at about 41.1 percent, according to Real Clear Politics. But let's take a look at some of the other numbers. Nancy Pelosi, 37 percent. Mitch McConnell, 26 percent. Chuck Schumer, 30 percent. So compared to them, he's actually done pretty good. Um, I just, I, I don't well, know. Here's, Where the, did you... here's the thing about those numbers, Stan, and you gotta, th this is the thing. Nancy Pelosi only has to be popular in her district. That's it. Mm -hmm. There are lots of Democrats who will say that they don't like Nancy Pelosi. That's not uncommon. Um, you know, like if, if a Repu and the same is true if a Republican was the, ha was the, uh, uh, was the speaker of the house, you know, there'd be lots of Republicans who would say bad things about them. That's just, that's just the way that game pl is played. Um, Donald Trump, it's a Nash, that's a national poll number for him. And he, that is, he has the lowest favorability rating. If you look at the presidents who've lost when they've sought reelection, his favorability rating is as low as any of, uh, as Jimmy Carter, as Gerald Ford. Um, and I'm trying to think, oh, George H. Bush, he, or yeah, George H. He, his numbers are in that same range. In fact, um, I believe uh, let me think. Gerald Ford's were actually around 45 percent and he still lost to Jimmy Carter. So and that's an average of all of them. And here's the other data set I will talk about. So those are averages. And I love real clear politics because they just take the averages. So you can't there's no claim of bias, you know, like this is a liberal or a conservative uh, poll. It's they take all the polls, they aggregate them. So then you get a pretty real clear picture. Right. So if you look at the recent polling and the recent Donald Trump's numbers have significantly taken a dive. Now, I don't know if that's a trend or if that's just a blip in the map, but the last several polls and the last several uh, favorability uh, polls have been significantly worse than 41%. Yeah, they're showing that. I'm sitting here looking at it right now. I'm going to take it on the screen so folks can see it, but the poll numbers have dipped uh, over the past several months. Those are Mr. Trump's poll numbers. Uh, of course, the inverse uh, would be uh, Joe Biden's numbers, which would be significantly higher, of course, uh, as Mr. Trump's goes lower, go lower. Uh, but you mentioned uh, that, that Donald Trump's facing a different election landscape, of course, than Pelosi or McConnell or Schumer. Very true. Um, so let's talk about the specific polls in the battleground states, okay? Uh, because Trump doesn't have to win the national poll or the national vote, I mean. Uh, he only has to win the battleground states, and his base is, I mean, they're much more likely to get out and vote than Joe Biden's base. So what, where, where does that go? What happens there? What does he have to, what is, what has to be done for either side to clinch victory? Well, basically what Donald Trump has to do is he has to hang on to those states up in the Midwest that he took, Michigan wisconsin pennsylvania it's funny because that was always referred to as the blue wall in the midwest for democrats right you know over the last you know five six seven election cycles that was their blue wall they are they're not blue states they're they're light blue states you know the the polling's always been close there and so um you, let's say you go to okay we've got wisconsin on the map right now so right now mm -hmm. biden's ahead by four in wisconsin according to the to the aggregate of averages Look at that top poll, though, from Fox News. Fox News is a very good polling. Uh, they do very good polling, very accurate polling. It shows Biden up nine there. And notice when, notice the date. Um, is at, is, it, it's just like the end of May, early June, as this whole, uh, this, all these racial protest, uh, protests over uh, race started. So that yeah. number... See, see the trend line? You can immediately just start looking. Okay, it was Biden plus three with Marquette, which they're pretty good. Um, CNBC, um, Change Research, that's a Democrat poll. It showed them as, at a tie. Um, but if you look at that top poll, um, of those three polls, Fox is by far and away the best polling company. So um, mm -hmm. that shows he's in trouble in Wisconsin. And so he, he could very well lose that state. How about Florida? Uh, the How polling out of Florida has been... Uh, Florida's Florida's the game. Uh, if Joe Biden wins Florida, this election's all but a wrap. I mean, so and right now, by uh, uh, aggregate of averages, he's up three point four. And here's the thing, Stan, and I always try to explain this to like uh, students when I talk to them, and 
uh, high school and, and college, when you're talking about polling specifically, okay, it's one thing to for a poll member like in the state of Arkansas. Arkansas is a small state, small population. So it doesn't take very many people to change their mind for the polling to change dramatically, right? Okay, right. Florida is a big state. And if you go down and look at all the polls that have been taken in Florida, it has been almost a year since Donald Trump even won a single poll. So that means every poll, conservative pollsters, liberal pollsters, Democrats, whatever you want to call them, everyone who's polling in Florida, including Fox, including CNN, including New York Times, all of them, they are showing Biden with a lead. And the thing about it is, if he's ahead there by three, four points, that's a huge margin. Barack Obama only won the state of Florida in 2012 by one point. Donald Trump Michigan won it was by number, 1.2. Michigan was one of the numbers you told me about in the polling that, that surprised me. Where are they at right now? Uh, right now, the latest poll out of Michigan is plus 16 Biden. And oh, wow. that, is an, a, a, that is a catastrophic number. And um, I, there, I've heard some rumblings coming out of the White House from some of their, uh, some people that work on his campaign and his reelection effort. They are very scared that they're losing Michigan, and they have a lot of internal polling that shows that they're in, they're underwater in that state. Michigan's a, a, is a is a a, a a different kind of midwestern state. Um, there's a lot of like uh, college educated whites are are trending away from the Republican Party right now. They're trending towards the Democrats. There's a lot of my, there's a high, there's several high uh, minority pockets inside the state of Michigan, you know, around Detroit, some of those cities. So sure. Michigan, it, it, and it's 16 electoral votes. It's huge, literally, you know, um, and he, he is doing very poorly there right now. And Joe Biden has, one of the reasons that Barack Obama picked him as his running mate was he expected him to do well in some of these uh, help him do better in some of these Midwestern states. Pennsylvania, which was a state that President Trump carried just barely, uh, 2016. Before that, it was Obama's in 2012 and 2008. Well, uh, here's where it's at right now. It's kind of back and forth still. There was a, a victory for Trump in the poll that was conducted the end of May. Not a lot of polling has been done really since then. But do you think if they were perhaps polling in the last few weeks in June with all the protests, that that could also be something that would tilt toward Biden's favor? Yes. And here's the thing about these polls. Um, prior to that Trump plus four poll, um, the polling in Pennsylvania had been devastating for Donald Trump. Um, so and here's the thing about polls. There can be outliers. And that's why I like the fact that Real Clear aggregates them, um, because if you looked at the polling numbers, like if you clicked on that all Pennsylvania, go back. Uh, okay. Yeah. Wow, if you looked at right. see, yeah, I mean, that's just one poll and that one poll though, they you'll see the, the colored um, area, you know, like the gray area. So they're only aggregating mm -hmm. those three polls. So if you look at all the other poll numbers out of there in the last year, Biden, and here's the thing, Joe Biden is essentially from Pennsylvania. It's essentially his home state. He grew up in Scranton. So, um, it, it, and that, I mean, you can just see in those numbers, that's one outlier poll. Every single other poll, Joe Biden's been ahead by a significant margin. There was one tie and there's a couple of one point uh, polls in there. But anyway, and also look at the, the this is another thing that's kind of interesting. You got to look at, look at the average at the top. Biden's at 48.3. That means he doesn't have to get, a, uh, he has to get a very small percentage of voters to get to 50. Donald mm -hmm. Trump's at 45. He has to get a significant, no, his number to get is much higher. So um, the state of Pennsylvania is looking really good for Joe Biden at this time. Yeah, he's got his hands all over it. Um, what about Minnesota? Let's, uh, let's talk about there. It looks like that uh, Joe Biden is showing some positive numbers there, but not exactly up to date polling data available there. I mean, we see that this was a state that Clinton won, Obama won. I guess it's expected that Biden's going to win this state, right? Yeah, I mean, Biden has to win this state. I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, Trump came close to taking it in, in uh, 2016, though. That's one of the states that he's going to try to pick off. I think that his team has probably come to the realization they're going to lose Michigan. They're probably going to lose Pennsylvania. So they're going to have to go out and they're going to have to hunt down some other states. And one of the states they have targeted is Minnesota. The problem is you just showed those poll numbers, Stan, and that was before this thing happened in Minneapolis. Look at that last poll. It happened five. It was taken five days before. So yeah. I would imagine that the next poll that comes out of Minnesota 
is going to be significantly better for Joe Biden. And even the polls that have come out so far have still been pretty good for him. So I think I think not it's saying he doesn't have work to do in that. No, you're right. Uh, uh, he will. He absolutely will. I think it was stunning also that in North Carolina, sorry for walking over you there, by the way, there's a bit of a delay here. So sometimes if people don't know, that's why. Um, but um, plus, I don't like you. Also, uh, in North Carolina, right. <laughs> people don't know we're friends. Um, but but in North Carolina, um, I can't believe I'm saying this. Biden's ahead by four points in the most recent poll. Now, that's a Democratic poll, but uh that poll has, has shown to be pretty unbiased in some of the other states where, where Trump was leading after they conducted research. So yes. is North Carolina going to be a battleground state now? Absolutely. Uh, people forget this, Stan. In 2008, Barack Obama won North Carolina. And oh, here's did. what's funny. He, he won it, and he barely lost it in 2012. Now, here's, here's uh, a little insight from inside Hillary Clinton's campaign in 2016. About two weeks out, they realized that some of their efforts that they were the 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 model that they used predicted that a certain number of African Americans would come out to vote. And they figured out with about two weeks to go that their model was wrong, that they were not turning up like that. So what they started doing is they started specifically target ads in North Carolina and Georgia. And here's the thing. There's a lot of political pundits out there and it was starting to work. They could see it in the numbers. The numbers started to rise. The problem was is that they didn't target Milwaukee, Philadelphia, and Detroit with the same type of effort. And so if they had just replicated those efforts in those state, in those cities, she probably would have won all three of those states in the upper Midwest. But what they saw in the numbers in Georgia, she only lost by like, I think, four and a half. And that's as ruby red a state as there is. So, And that mm. state is also going to be in play, too, this year. Interesting. You mentioned the betting odds, and I, while we were talking, I pulled those up because I wanted to to go into those a little bit more. I think that's very interesting, by the way. The betting odds, not exactly the same thing as looking at the national polls. People that bet money, their only uh, their only dog in the, the hunt, so to speak, uh, or in the fight, is making more money, right? Um, so right. <laughs> I, I think you bring up a very valid point in that when you're looking at at polling data, it's it's it can skew one way or another. Minds can always be changed, but when you put money down on something, maybe it means something different. So let's take a look at this, right? And and I think it's very interesting if you look at the data and look at where things shifted. Um, I'll pull this up right now so you can see it as well on the screen. You should be able to anyway. Um, first, let me start up at the top with the data. You can see the latest um, betting odds data, which was June 16th. I guess that's today, right? Um, Biden... Mm -hmm. Plus 13. This is more than you and I even went into this broadcast talking about. Yes. So plus 13 uh, in the latest. And here's the thing, Stan, and I'll tell you what that's, that could be reflective of. Okay, so when I told you about the, the poll out of Arkansas where uh, Biden was only down by two to Trump, the betting odds when that poll came out shifted like 0.1 or 0.2 percent. And as polls come out, because they react, the the uh, the gamblers react to conditions as they as they happen. I have to believe that that poll number that came out of Michigan today probably is why you're seeing that jump. Because if you take Michigan off the board and put it in Biden's in Biden's pocket, if you take it off the board, Donald Trump is in serious trouble. And look at like you said, the only thing gamblers care about is making money. They don't care about politics. They don't care about liberal conservative. They don't care about none of this dog whistle stuff. They only care about no money. Joke. And so that's why I always tell people if I had to trust one thing, it's the betting odds. Uh, enough dog whistles are being blown during this year for my entire lifetime, my friend, by the way. Uh, just wanted to say <laughs> that like you can apply that to whatever you wish. OK, on the subject right here. Look at where things shifted. It was June 1st. I think it actually literally was June 1st when Biden jumped in the lead in the betting odds for the very first time. What happened around June 1st, George? All those protests. That's what's going on right now in the whole country. Yeah. So this has energized people on the left in a way that I honestly not thought I would ever see people get... Um, just quite frankly, so anti-police. I, I, this is this is beyond me and my my understanding. But that's that's uh, 
neither here nor there. I do understand why the video is extremely upsetting to so many people. Uh, very upsetting to me as well, as as has been any instance of police misconduct. If you follow this website, you know, that's one of the biggest things I've reported on since I started uh, four years ago. But it's it's a little still, it's surprising to me to see that's the moment, on the betting odds at least, that the split happened and it went from looking like Trump was going to win almost overnight to looking like Biden was probably going to get it. Yeah, and I mean, and it, the the cha- the sea change is dramatic, as I told you earlier today. I don't know that I've ever seen such a, and we'd have to go back and look. Um, but that is a dramatic shift. I mean, I mean, just it's unbelievable, and it seems to be getting it, the the margin seems to be growing every day. And well, I don't think I don't think these recent spate of polls that have come out are helping. Um, I don't think that you know this. This COVID-19, I mean, people have this assumption in their head that it's like getting better when it's actually getting much worse. I mean, mm. you know, the number of hospitalizations in the state of Arkansas has doubled in what, the last week I'm mean, a week or two? Yeah, I mean, but it's not nearly as bad as we thought it was going to be. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's not great, but it, two months ago, we thought it was, you know, AIDS that you can catch from coughing on somebody. Now we realize it's a bad case of pneumonia. Yeah, well, and it also disproportionately affects a certain age group. I mean, you saw the numbers today. Everything else, right? (laughs) Well, yeah, that's true to a degree. I mean, I'll say this about COVID. It doesn't seem to affect kids the way the flu does, though. It's kind of interesting. I mean, some of the research I've seen says that they seem to be less susceptible to it. So it's actually not as bad for kids for whatever reason. I think kids are, uh, right now, they show the um, highest percentage of new tests or new carriers in Arkansas, with most being asymptomatic, like you said, for whatever reason. They, they don't show symptoms, but they can still carry it and transmit it to uh, to others. Um, but it's, it's and my point was to say that that has, over the past two months, gone from something that, that even to me seemed like it was going to be a much more horrible thing, to now it, it, it's... Not great by any means, but it's not what what a lot of people were afraid of. The polling data and, and or the betting odds, I guess I should say, uh, showing that Trump maintained a pretty much an unwavering lead during COVID through the month of May, but then in mm-hmm. June things changed, and as we know, what happened? Well, we've talked about that, but anyway, um, so. COVID didn't really affect the polls, or at least the betting odds, I guess. It may have affected no, the polls in it, some states. Well, here's the thing, Stan. It could be um, maybe he was he, he was doing okay through the COVID uh, crisis that we had. But the problem is, is was this just the straw that broke the camel's back? Were there, are there people out there who were like, okay, I can put up with this COVID response to this point. But then this happened, and that sent mm-hmm. everybody over the edge. Because that literally, look at how it toppled. I mean, it... And, you know, and the thing about it is a lot of what did he do that that was so wrong in in, about that issue? Well, you know, and I talk to a lot of people in a lot of different groups and a lot of black people think he's racist and they think he says racist things. And so this just this just magnified that whole issue, all of this. And also remember, these protests are happening in big cities and big cities are um, if if a state like let's say Arkansas will, was truly going to vote for Joe Biden, it you know people living out in the rural parts of the state obviously are not going to vote for Joe Biden. It's going to be people in no. Little Rock and people in Fayetteville, you know, and even people in Jonesboro to a degree. You know, these big urban areas in the city in the state. So um, these protests are happening in those places. So the energy is there, um, and I think that President Trump already had most of his rural base put together. But his rural base is not big enough to carry him across the finish line. He won that election in 2016 because independence broke to him at the very end. Um, oh, I set something really cool up in the screen. So now while you're talking, we can look at the polling data too. So, um, But yeah, you're, you're, I mean, you're bringing up great points, understandably so. It's just how much of that can last if, if okay, this energized the Democrats, it's June. You know what I mean? Like in June of the 2016 election, yeah. they were energized pretty well too. 
And then we see what happened after that, which was when uh, things went pretty well south for uh, Hillary Clinton. Um, you know, I mean, there were some... She did a little bit of a lame job toward the end of her campaign. I think that that, that didn't help her. And, of course, James Comey didn't help her or anything like that. But, you know, a lot can happen between now and November. I'll be honest, and, and I know this is an opinion, I guess. I'm just not convinced Joe Biden's going to win. You know, um, at this point, this is th there's a reason why Donald Trump was ahead in the betting odds, is because number one, um, the Republican Party has an electoral advantage to a degree. If they can hold those three midwestern states that they took from the Democrat column, so Donald Trump won those states. So automatically, he has a slight electoral advantage. There's almost no scenario where Joe Biden can get less votes than Donald Trump and beat him in the electoral college. There's no scenario where that happens. So he has to get Joe Biden for him to win this election. He's going to have to run the score up in the realm of a Barack Obama 2008, where Obama got 71 million votes, which is the most votes ever cast for president. So he's going to have to be in that range. I will say this about Joe Biden. Um, it's been very, I, I would say he's probably been pretty smart to kind of lay low. Everybody keeps talking about it, him not really being out and doing a lot, but he's not doing a lot and he seems to be expanding his lead. So um, that's probably the, the, play for him. And also you got to remember, he has another major shoe that's going to drop. And that's when he picks his running mate. And I have told yeah, people gonna be? For, for two years, it, it will be, I believe, and this is just my personal belief, I believe it'll be a black female. Um, I, from the beginning, Kamala Harris, that's who I, I think I've told you that before. Um, I just have a sneaking suspicion just the way I watched them interact. I know they had the one debate where they went off the rails on each other. But after that, the chemistry um, between them, she's fundraised a lot for him. She checks a lot of boxes for him. Um, you know, and I, I you know, and, and Stan, we both know this is true in the TV age. You know, generally the most attractive candidate wins. Well, Joe Biden and Donald Trump both look awful, so we can't use that metric with them. But, you know, you put yeah. Kamala Harris on the stage. She is a well-spoken, uh, attractive person. And, you know, that's just, uh, th that generally works. I mean, I don't know how else to say it. She did jump out on the, the lead on all of the police um, reform stuff that's being talked about, uh, I noticed. Uh, she seemed to be one of the lead Democrat voices on reform and change in relation to that. Today, Donald Trump signed an executive order uh, relation in, in relation to police misconduct, setting up a national uh, or, or ordering the creation of a national tracking database, I guess. Do um, mm -hmm. you think that's going to help him? How, how will that affect uh, what we're looking at? Uh, you know, I don't, uh, I have, uh, you know, he's going to, he's going to try to become this law and order president kind of in the vein of a Richard Nixon back in 1972. Yeah. And that worked for Nixon. Great. Because, there was this, what they, they called it at the time, the silent majority, that while all these protesters were out there, there was a silent majority of people, uh, predominantly middle class uh, white people who didn't like all the protests. They didn't like the war. They didn't like all that stuff, but they did not like all of well, the other stuff that was going on. The problem is, is that most of the people that don't like the protests or don't like the rioting that's going on that are very much against it, they were vote already in his camp anyway. So... He's again, he's got to find a way to reach out to independence. And, you know, Stan, I'll tell you, another, there's another dynamic that's playing out here, too. The crippling effects of COVID is, in terms of what's happening to our economy are starting to actually be felt. The stimulus went out. You know, people got money. They went out and spent money on stuff. Well, now they're a month and a half removed, a lot of them from that stimulus payment. And, you know, we have, you know, we had... Uh, a record unemployment, you know, we had the highest unemployment rate we've had since the Great Depression. And that is going to have an impact. And another thing is, too, and I, I tell people this. So as of today, right now, we have one hundred and what, 19,000 people who've died from COVID-19. Well, you remove one hundred and nineteen thousand people from the economy. That's a big hit. You know, those people are no longer spending money or doing things. So that's going to have an economic impact as well. So we're starting to see the oh, trickle down yeah. effect of all these things. Uh, yeah, but I mean, we're not talking about a hundred and whatever thousand, you know, 30 year old healthy adult Americans. I mean, we're talking about a large portion of that being people with pre-existing conditions and, and, and elderly, right? Yeah, 
but they still spend money and, and society still spends money on them. Like even if you have somebody in a nursing home, somebody's paying for that care. And when, you know, when they pass away, yeah. that they're not, it's not being paid anymore. And so that's an economic hit to whatever businesses that impacts. That's yeah. Well, that's, that's true. Um, I, I just don't know how much of that blame is going to be felt by Trump because how is this his fault? Well, here's the thing. Presidents, rightly or wrongly, are given credit when the economy is good or they're given the blame when it's bad. When George W. Bush left office, his favorability rating was at 25%. Uh, Jimmy good. Carter lost in, in 1980 because the economy was bad. And Ronald Reagan got up there and said, hey, we can do better than this. And things were a little bit better in 1984, and he got reelected in a landslide. Same thing with Barack Obama in 2008. The economy was bad. The electorate blamed the party in power. He, he swept to election. The economy got better during his first term. He got reelected. So it's a pretty predictable pattern. Um, and don't think that some of the, the betting odds, some of their data sets they're working off of, are not tied to some of these economic indicators. Because generally, when people go, people want to feel good when they go to the voting booth. If they, if they feel good, they're going to reelect the person who's in there. Because like, hey, this, this person is making my life better. But if they go into the voting booth, and the economy is bad and we're still dealing with this virus and there's all this racial strife, a lot of people are going to say, my life isn't good. We need a change. Well, I got you here. Uh, let's talk about the protests for a second. Um, what, is, what is the goal of the people protesting? What do they want to see happen in relation to police or reform or action by the government or changes? What... Can you tell me what that is? You know, uh, from everything that I've read and studied about uh, the protests that are going on right now, you know, um, I think that we have to sit down and have a real conversation in this country about how we want to police ourselves, because that's essentially what this is. This isn't the police and us. This is all of us. And we, ha we need to sit down and have a serious conversation about a society where we have 5% of the population of the world, but we have 25% of the world's incarcerated people. And so, you know, maybe we need to look at our laws. Maybe there needs to be changes to our laws. Do, do, do all of these laws that we have on the books that are crimes now, are they necessarily crimes in other countries? Because other countries look at us and they laugh. They're like, you guys criminalize everything. And so um, that's a conversation we need to have. Plus, I think that there also needs to be a conversation about, um, you know, like, there, there is a problem with police brutality towards uh, black men. That's a problem. And anybody who doesn't recognize that, you're, you're not seeing. And it's got to stop. And, um, you know, we've had an incident in Atlanta this weekend where a guy got shot in the back. I understand. And, I, you know, I hear all the, I'll hear these arguments where they'll bring up the, um, the, the victim's past criminal behavior. They'll bring up, well, he resisted arrest. Well, here's the thing. I've been on death row for executions. Last time I checked, we don't execute people for resisting arrest or having a previous criminal record. And so we can't, we can't have like vigilante justice in the streets where, you know, a police officer can just decide, okay, this guy's a threat to me. I'm just going to shoot him. And for no reason, it has, there has to be a balance. And I understand I why these people happened. are angry. Under, I understand. I don't think that's what happened with the, the situation in Atlanta. And so, uh, but I, I do agree with you in, in the other regard, of course, with, with uh, what happened to George Floyd. That was absolutely unjustifiable. But, I mean, in the situation in Atlanta, the guy was, and I'm going to show the video well, footage car right in here a Wendy's while we're drive talking. Lane. See if this has audio. Drive through right. Kill the audio on this. Um, I'm killing the audio on this because I think it's a, a local news report. But basically, here's the footage. And, and as I skip around, you can see he gives him a breathalyzer. The guy was passed out drunk. Um, they go to arrest him. And when they go to put him in handcuffs here in just a second, what's going to happen is he's going to jerk away. Um, that's obviously not something that should be punishable by death. Then we're going to take a look at him fighting with and punching the officers. He steals one of their tasers. You can see that in the video. Then as you move forward, watch what happens. You can see him turn around and fire the taser. You can hear a click as though it was fired at that point in the video. Um, now they're going to be showing footage of, uh, I believe, the officer. But but I just want to go back to this for a second. He fired a shot from a, a yes, it's a less than lethal weapon, but
but it is a weapon, boom, right there at an officer, even though he was running away from him. What it, it, now tell me is that is that it's not the same thing as somebody that's being shot in the back that wasn't resisting or doing anything wrong to police. I'm not saying it makes it justified or not, but that's a totally different story than we're kind of hearing in a lot of the narrative that, that's in the media, wouldn't you say? Um, I actually, I mean, I knew I'm fully aware of all of that. And what I, what I'll say, Stan, is again, is, is shooting a taser at a police officer is that a death sentence in the law? And it's Can not. Be. Yeah. Well, it, it, I, I mean, it's not. He got fired, and the police chief has resigned, and they're opening investigation, and the dude is probably going to get charged criminal. I mean, you, we we have to be careful in society where we we give these awesome powers to authority figures. Uh, you know, it, like uh, if he had, if he had turned and and confronted that cop with that taser, he was running away from him. They had his car. They were going to be able to arrest him. You know, I mean, I don't he, listen. He did I'm not turn defending. And shoot. Right, he turned and fired it, but I mean, it's a it's a taser; it's not a lethal weapon. I, I mean, I'm just saying he he did turn it. It's 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 so the officer should have let him run away. Yeah, because they could just go to his house and arrest him later. I mean, the guy was drunk and he was running from the cops. I mean, hmm. I'm not defending that behavior, obviously, because it's wrong. I'm not defending him fighting with the cops, and I have right. a great respect. I have a lot of cop friends. Um, and they have a very hard job. And as you know, I've covered several cops who've been murdered while they're on duty. Um, but yeah. if the guy had a gun, yeah, I have no, there's no issue there, but just to be scuffling with the cops. I mean, I guess my problem is I've seen so many of these things in the past, you know, just like being a journalist, being a reporter, I've seen cops have to deal with drunks, people high on drugs on a Saturday night. And there's always scuffles and confrontations and this stuff. And, you know, I mean, if the guy had a gun, yeah, I mean, I could see you, you're, you're, it's indefensible then. But when you shoot a guy in the back twice, it's just like, why are we killing somebody just because he's running away? Well, I think it may have, it was because he fired the weapon, uh, but uh, the taser, and it may have even struck the officer. I don't know that that makes it justifiable, nor am I trying to make that, that point. But, um, you know, whenever we as media get out there in front of this stuff and say, shot an unarmed man in the back. And that's all we report. We're contributing to a lot of the, the social unrest, don't you think? Um, actually, I don't. I think what's if somebody asked me about the George Floyd, why is this one so much different? It's because you actually have a video of the guy dying. And it's not even media anymore. It, there's no story that you or I could have written about George Floyd. When you, the thing that, that enraged everyone was the video. And when you see the video of like the, that guy scuffling with the police and then he's running off and then he gets shot, when people get mad is when they see the video. And it doesn't even matter what we say about it. And I agree with you to a certain degree. Uh, people in the media need to be very careful about the narratives that they try to write. You know, the only thing I'm saying about like the second incident in Atlanta, the, the part that is absolutely to me unforgivable is the bullets in the back, because that is such a like a cliche term especially for people, uh, uh, you know, black men, especially in this country, there's so many instances where they've been shot in the back and, you know, you'll see all these stories and you're sitting there going, okay, well, the only way you can shoot somebody in the back is because their back turned to you. Right. Mm. I mean, so I don't know. That's just my personal but opinion. You, you, can have, kind of you can have your back to somebody and still be turning around and shooting at them too. I mean, with a taser, no, I'm, I'm of course, but I'm just saying that, you know, he, he could be partially, he could be running one direction. And, and as we saw in the video, I mean, we're watching it now. He's fighting with officers. Uh, their adrenaline is rushing because here you got a guy that's that's punching them because they're trying to do their job. There's one punch right to the face. He's got the yep. taser from him. And and there he goes. So I think they're going to step out of view at this point. I don't think we see the rest from, from this particular camera angle. Um, but, you know, he turned around and... and, and and fired that it appeared in the previous video that I showed you, it looked like he fired it at the officer. So what if he hit him with the taser at that point? The guy would have been tased for a few seconds and that would have been. So the officer should at that point have just taken the, taken the, the shock, I guess. I think I almost lost you there for a second. So do you, but, but the officer basically, no, I mean, here's the thing. Uh, th and I thought, Uh, 
well, I'm not saying what the officer should or shouldn't do as far as like his response to him. What I'm saying is, is that we can't have police. They knew he wasn't armed. They had patted him down. And I saw a prosecutor talk about this. They said, if a case is brought against this officer, it's going to be the, the simple case will be this. They patted him down. They knew he didn't have any weapons on him. So you, in order to use lethal force legally in this country, you have to feel danger. There has to be something. There has to be mortal danger to you or someone in the vicinity. He had that taser gun, which, again, is not a, it's not a lethal weapon. Uh, you tase somebody, and 10 seconds later, they're fine. Um, it's, and that's how the police market using tasers. They say, look, this is a way safer way of doing this. You know, this just incapacitates someone for a few seconds so that we can subdue them. And so you can't make the argument that it's a non-lethal weapon. You knew he didn't have a lethal weapon, but then you use lethal force against him as he's running away. I want to point out that uh, I wish that the officer hadn't shot him. Uh, and I wish that none of that had taken place. And, uh, you know, the loss of his life is, is something that is tragic to me. Uh, and I wish that that was uh, a different set of circumstances that happened. I do want to point out that uh, I'm trying to understand what's going on in our country right now from a perspective that's not just one or not just my own. Um, police have a job that you often can't empathize with unless you're doing it yourself. You're a police officer. Um, Stan, so, that is so... You know, I tell people about the police. They have the most... Um, What's the, I don't know what the word it's it, no, nobody is grateful for the job they do. No one, no. because anytime you deal with a police officer, it's always in a negative context. They stop you um, on the side of the road. Something happened in your family and you have to talk to a police officer about it. Or if somebody, or, or if you commit a crime, then you obviously have to deal with the police. So it's always negative. And it's the most thankless job in the world. I tell a lot of my police officer friends, I would never want that job. It's a tough, it's, it's a tough thing. Um, I don't know if they need to revise their training methods or if they just need to adopt different, you know, methodologies and weaponry or whatever they need to do. Um, but something has to change. I mean, I, again, I, I, I agree. I, Sorry, go ahead. I agree. I was just going to say we cannot have, you know, lethal vigilante justice being if this imagine this, if that guy shot the police officer in the back. He would be, it would be no doubt about it, gone, that's it. doesn't matter why he did it. He's going to jail. It's a crime, period. When the situation is reversed, he's resisting arrest. That is a misdemeanor crime in most cases. Grabbing the taser and, and shooting it at him, that probably rises to aggravated assault, which yeah, could, be, a could become a felony. It would come it to a felony. Right. So and by the way, at, at that the, point, punching the officer when he punched the officer was when it became a felony because that at that point he committed uh, assault on a law enforcement or medical right. personnel. If if that was in Arkansas, and I don't know, there's there's state laws there in that state, but in Arkansas that would have been the felony point. Yeah, and the thing of it is though, but even with those two things being a felony, they are not there. There is no provision that he would have gone. He would have. They would have provision that he would go to death row for either one of those things or be charged with capital murder. So he can't, the standard has to be the same for all people in society. Like I said, it's not the police and us, it's us policing us. Well, we have to decide if we're going to let people run away from the cops uh, on a certain <clears throat> degree of charges, right? Like that guy was running, going to run away from the cops after having committed a felony assault. Um, and then when he stole the officer's taser and shot him with it or shot at him with it, an arguable secondary felony aggravated assault. Mm -hmm. um, they, what yep. was the answer to allow somebody that had committed several felonies to flee? Or was the answer to take him into custody? Um, the reason I say those are the two is because I don't think there's anything in between there. I don't think I, I, he well, was either going to be, uh, he wasn't going alive well, I, and he fought them that way, you know? No, I mean, here's the thing. The guy was drunk. I don't know how far he could have outran them. I mean, he might have gotten past the parking lot. I mean, um, th that's the thing. I mean, what's worse is allowing someone to flee from the police or to gun them down in the street. Um, okay, that's a fair question. And I, 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 can't, I can't say to you that, that I believe gunning them down in the street would be the right choice, but um, I didn't... You know, that's incendiary rhetoric, and I didn't see it that way. And I'm the first one to... Well, to I mean, that's just literally this. what happened, though. The guy was shot in the back twice, and he died. I mean... 
Oh, that's um, what happened if you tell the story from a, a perspective of this sentence before and after paragraphs taken out, yes. But if you if you say he fought with police, he took their weapons, he committed felony assault, he, he was running away, but then he turned around and shot one of the officers, and then he turned back around and kept running, which was in that split second when the officer made the decision to fire, and then the officer shot him. So yeah, that, yeah I'm just saying, I, I think it's, I, I consider it a little bit different. Obviously... We look at this a little bit differently, which is unusual maybe for people that have heard us before. Um, but at, at the same time, when you take a look at what happened with George Floyd, man, I, that officer that kneeled on his neck should be given the damn death penalty. Um, that was unforgivable. Like the other officers that were there with him should have kneed him in the face and knocked him off of that guy and arrested him. But they didn't, and they put us in this whole mess. And so, you know, that being the case, I think that now everybody's so angry that anything that happens, we're going to be hypersensitive to. But when a person is, is, you know, there has to be instances where, I mean, police can't lose the fight, right? They're not, they can't lose the fight. Right. But we can't have armed agents of the government out deciding in a split second we have a justice system for a reason and if if that man had been charged with felony aggravated assault he should have a day in court and then he should go before a judge and then he can be prosecuted and then we can t take care of him as a society what happened in this case is the officer in an instant decided and here's the thing the prosecutor the the prosecutor is already looking at this case he's going to get charged with a crime because it's not i mean he right. knew that the guy didn't have a, yeah, I'm pretty sure he is. Um, but he didn't, he didn't have a weapon on him that there was no need for the officer. The only well, way an officer can shoot you. No, but, but an officer, this is the law. An officer can only shoot someone with use lethal force. If they're feel, feel like they're in mortal danger or they're someone else is being is in mortal danger as well. Right. There is nobody else. There's no, I mean, how could he be in mortal danger if the dude's running away from him? Well, he's not. If he turns, if he's got a taser prong in his chest, that officer's got a pretty good defense, in my opinion. Wouldn't you say? No, because it's not lethal. I mean, it's just it'd be like throwing a rock at him. I mean, you know, you could you, you could well, say like maybe the prong would hit him in the right spot on his body, and maybe it would cause some kind of deadly injury. But you know, he could turn around throwing a rock at him, and it's gonna hurt. But I mean, it's not. I mean, I just when I see that, I you know, saying like you said, we just don't agree on this one because I just see it differently. I've, I've heard several prosecutors talk about this ever since this thing happened the other night. Um, and every one of them, uh, they said that he had no, there was absolutely no, there was no way he should have used uh, lethal force, period. He patted the guy down. They knew he had nothing on him. The guy was drunk and passed out in a car. And here's the other thing. Why didn't they just uh, let the guy walk home? Why did they even arrest him? Why were they putting cuffs on him? Because he committed a crime. But it was a minor. I mean, it's a misdemeanor. I mean, I mean, but you, but I mean, you would be you would be upset if they did if they let cops out of crimes. If if they let cops out of if cops let cops out of DWIs, you know, we'd yeah. be on here talking or, about, but about what that. But what I'm saying is, you, back to our original back to the original point though that we were talking about the fact that we have two strenuous laws. I mean, if you know the guy, if the guy lives two blocks away, why go through the process of writing up a report, taking him down to the drunk tank, doing all this other stuff? Just take him home. And then fine him, make him pay a fine. I mean, there could well, be. I, I'm not saying that's the. I'm not saying that's what they should do. I'm just presenting it as another another option because this system doesn't seem to be working very well. Well, that that will. I don't know how that's going to teach him to not uh, to not do that anymore, right? Wouldn't that? Isn't that going to be kind of like saying, stand, "Hey, go get drunk. Stand, we'll give you a ride home." No, Stan. You know this as well as I do. Most people who participate in activities like that, nothing teaches them anyway. Fair. Um, unfortunately true. That's also unfortunately true. You're right. When somebody's an addict, you can't get through to them with logic uh, or otherwise, but you put them in a jail cell, that that can be kind of a, a sobering reality when they have to go sober up and, and get off of the dope or get off of the, the liquor uh, in a drunk tank. You know, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I got to tell you, I hate this. I hate that this guy got shot. And I hate that um, we've seen cases where police have, have abused their power. We have. We've seen it here. 
I've reported on most of them here. Probably was the person yeah, that no, actually first lot. reported it. Um, it's true. But I feel like that there is a point or a place that we have to say, what do we expect of them? I mean, if if the expectation is let the let the person run away and don't use deadly force to stop them, we need to state that clearly to the officers. They should. They deserve. I bet they well, would love that. And- Stan, I'm telling you that it has been said they they when when they're when they take their oath, I mean the, the the rules for engagement are clear. You have to feel your life is in danger, mortal danger, and or someone else. That's the bottom line. And it, he knew he had no lethal weapon on him. And that yeah. if you're a prosecutor, that's what you're going to tie your case to is that he is a police officer, and they fired him immediately. And the police chief resigned. Well, of course, they knew this was going to blow up. I mean, they that. That has a lot more to do, in my opinion, with public relations than with actual justice. Is it, when when you're talking Good. about you're right. resignations, yeah. I mean, that's that's more about look. If you had ten thousand people angry walking down the city hall right now, I could promise you we could get the mayor to do something. It might not be what he wanted to do, but we could get it. So I, I would, and they went and burned down the Wendy's, by the way, which really helps. They um, did. But, I mean. Well, how does that? Look, happen? I don't what listen. You know, okay, I, I, I'm crossed about stuff like that for two reasons. Because first, you know, like going back into history, you know, our country was kind of founded on the precept that we basically destroyed British towns in the colonies. We dumped all the, we dumped twenty million dollars worth of tea in the Boston Harbor. So there's a part That's of true. being an American that we just we do these things. Um, there's another part of me, though, obviously. Uh, I don't. I hate it to see that you know, like small business owners lose their businesses. I mean, I don't. That, it's th- awful. I don't think the British monarchy had anything to do with the Baconator, you know. But like, I just don't that's get probably true. That, that, <laughs> probably that not. Restaurant had to go down into cinders over that. I mean, I, I just, I those are the elements that I don't understand. I don't. I don't. And I'll tell you what I disagree with completely. Even though some people, oh, you're only supposed to report the facts. Well, <laughs> you, you spend twenty years reporting the facts, and you gain some decent enough context to share sometimes. When I see these protesters in the streets screaming in the officer's face who have to sit there and take that, let me tell you, yeah. you're not helping the cause. You're creating new enemies nope. that now resent you out there. And so when I see those people screaming, just say their name. Just say, like, you, you're screaming that at some 21-year-old guy that probably just went through the academy <laughs> and he's forming his opinions about society as we speak. So you're you're... Solution is going to be to shout that person down. That's not how you win people over. And we know that. Exactly we all right. know that. But but I know emotions are high. And and I can say, understandably so. It's just to me, when we see the people that get out there and that are screaming for the change, hey, great. Now, support local news. Support local newspapers. Support the journalists that have been fighting for this for the past four or five, ten years who have been telling you about the problems, who have written books worth of articles or books, in your case, in general, about the problems. But if all you can do is go and burn down a Wendy's and scream in a cop's face, and then you're not going to support the people that are actually trying to do the change, it's hard for me to take somebody like that seriously in the public square, in the public debate. So, you know... We've gone from... Stan I'll, Stan, I'll say this, though. I think the vast majority of protesters, there are some idiots out there who take advantage of situations like this to do, go out and yep, there are. burn buildings down and steal stuff some and local just ones act too. like fools. Yeah, yeah seriously. I mean, that's, yeah, and I, you know, uh, nobody has any mercy or pity for those idiots. Um, the, and it, what you said, uh, I'll say this about the police. 95% of every police officer I've ever dealt with in any capacity has been a good police officer. Same here. They always Same have the here. best intention, and they want they work their asses off. I'm sorry if I said that on your show. Um, oh, but don't they worry. Work... We can say the F word if you want, but that's fine. Okay, I'm good. No, well... don't, don't say that. Don't say the F word. I'm just kidding. Uh, but they uh, they have a, a thankless job. Nobody cares about them, and um, I really feel for these guys. You know, I see these stories coming out. That a lot of them are retiring or quitting all across the country and all this other stuff. And I feel bad for those guys. And I really do. You know, um, it's kind of like in journalism, Stan, you and I've talked about this. There are some people who are in our profession who are really good at what they do. And then there's some people who are really bad 
And we should never defend the bad ones who make up stuff and, and, and pass it off as news. Oh, I 100% agree with that. And I don't think that... Um, but but even, even then, I mean, journalists, you know we are inclined to assume that all journalists, even if they're not, are coming from a good place. So we have that same inclination that police would, that... That, that police would not do something bad. They probably are less likely to believe that than others in society. But I think any of us would be if we walked in their shoes or in that walk of life because we do it for our own. Um, I guess in summation of everything that we've talked about here, I feel like that in the press, we are latching on to some incendiary terms and making this worse when there are moments that we should be mad and moments that we should rally and protest in City Hall. Not really moments we should burn down the Baconator, but there are moments that we should get angry and cause change to take place. But we damage our credibility and ability to call for that change if we're constantly crying wolf about everything that happens when the at least core supporting group of those police can tell this one's not so black and white. This one's not... And that's how they look at this Wendy's one. I'm just letting you know. I, I haven't heard a single police officer defend the George Floyd situation. I've talked to probably at least 100 about it. Not one has defended it. Um, but it, it, this, you know, and others are going to be different. When you see somebody fighting with an officer, it's going to be different. That being said, I, I, man, I do wish that officer wouldn't have done that. That was a terrible decision that he made. Uh, I don't know. You mentioned criminal charges. I don't know what's going to happen. Obviously, it's it's a political firestorm there. And he may get charged or a grand jury indictment just to settle things down. We know that happens. We can't act like that doesn't happen. You and I both know that happens. But It also happens in another instance, too, if you committed the crime. Sure. Well, that's true. That's true. Um, but I would suspect you'll see a grand jury impaneled, and I would suspect that will drag out for several months, and my, I guess my expectation, I'm not making a prediction, but my expectation is that they will get off on charges on that. I think the George Floyd murderers are going to go to prison, at least the guy Chauvin that, that kneeled on his neck. He should go to prison for the rest of his life. Um, the others who were there with him should probably spend some time there too, but we, we I don't know. I, I just think that we have to, we have to decide okay, are we going to totally abandon the officers now and not even let them defend themselves? And I know that you're, you know, difference in defending themselves and killing someone I know, but, but again, split second decisions, guy got punched in the face. He just got shot with a taser. It's, that is not premeditated murder. It's not no. cut and dry. Well, and there's also, the, the, you know? there's another element and it's a minor, and it's not an element that I would even really bring up because it, obviously the guy got shot and killed. But even the officer losing his taser, he probably would have been written up just for that, you know, um, the, the because officer? they're trained. Yeah, I mean, they're trained to keep their, uh, you know, they're trained to keep certain distances from uh, suspects. Of course, they get on top of them. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff. But I heard somebody talking about that uh, today, which I don't know how much of that. Um, I don't know, because, I mean, losing your weapon in the middle of a fight's a pretty big deal, so... I'll, I'll tell you something that I've thought and studied for years that I think would help police. Now, there's there's a funny reason why that it's probably not going to be implemented, but Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu teaches people of the two main things. It teaches you control over the, the opponent's body, and it teaches you when to let go of your choke or your arm bar or your leg bar, whatever you're doing. If, if it was mandatory for all officers to get at least their first stripe of a white belt in jiu-jitsu, or at least complete the basic classes of control, of how to control somebody, put the hooks in over and under on the back, ride them until they're tired, in essence, not just immediately go for lethal force. I feel like officers, by the way, there you go, right on the screen. Good. Hope that tasted great. That was vodka, by the way, for the audience. No, I'm just kidding. It was yeah, that was vodka. vodka. <laughs> uh, knowing you, it probably was gym clear. But anyway, um, so I think that I think if we gave officers the ability to control the situation and the training, then you wouldn't have as many instances of the need to use a taser or lethal force or or the situation escalating like that. 
Um, I agree, Stan. I, that we talked about earlier about like thinking differently, thinking out of mm-hmm. the box, not assuming that this really pretty crappy system that we have now, we need to change it. I mean, we don't need this but, many people in jail. We don't need this many no. people dying in the streets. And it's not working. And so like what you're saying right there, I mean, that may be a highly effective, better method for taking down a, a, a but, potential suspect. I'll tell you why it won't ever it won't ha- happen, especially now, and that's because there is now a nationwide movement to ban chokeholds, and I don't think the people that are behind that are going to support training police in professional fighting maneuvers, um, and I can understand why, but also the process of learning that stuff. Here, here it is, because I have my, my first stripe in my white belt and probably qualified for the second, according to my, my instructor. But um, the first thing you do for six months is you get your butt kicked really bad every day for six months. And you learn, hey, these people could kill me at any time that they wanted to. So when my eyes are about to pop out of my head and I'm just about to pass out and they let you go, you learn real fast that's the right thing to do. And so... Yes, you're going to have to get those people okay with getting their butts kicked for the first six months of class. But after that, you're going to be on a different level where you know how to control, you know how to defend yourself. And even if the guy's too much for you, you know how to keep him off of you with your feet on the ground. So, but but again, that's an outside of the box thing. And I don't know how we're going to convince politicians that don't know anything about chokeholds uh, to send police off to get trained by the Gracies, you know? And probably not. <laughs> but I haven't had a hoist reference I, I, in a long time. You liked the hoist reference, didn't you? Yeah. Um, I, I, um, Henner and um, and Hiram Gracie are uh, the ones that uh, I have followed online in the distance classes, but nothing compares to having an actual uh, in gym experience and uh, leaving every day with more bruises than than skin that's uh, actually not bruised. You know, it's painful. It's painful. But at the same time, there's a camaraderie that you learn in that. There's a sportsmanship that you learn in that. And there's also, um, you know, a security you have. You're not afraid to get on your back or go to the ground or whatever else. And take away some of those fears, maybe that helps. Um, you know, in some countries, officers don't have guns. There's no way we could ever do that here, right? We could never do that here because everybody's got a gun in America. So, well, that's probably true. Yeah, you're right. George is is brought up the good point. We have to think outside of the box. I'd love to know what everybody in chat, uh, what their ideas are. Tell us what you're thinking is is an answer or the answer or just a step in the right direction because we want to know and we want to have that conversation too. Uh, it's been a great conversation to have with you, George, and I really do appreciate it. Tell everybody where to go buy your books, please. Uh, you can buy them on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. You can get on their website and probably where, I mean, we don't have a Barnes and Noble in Jonesboro right now because of the tornado, but other yep. Barnes and Nobles around the state carry them. So come out and buy a book and you can leave me a review. And even if you don't like it, you think it's horrible writing and I'm a bad journalist, then you can put that on there too. I'm happy for the comments. I, I hope that we've gotten at least one or two of uh, your trolls and mine uh, in chat. I've not been watching it the whole time, to be quite honest. I don't most of the time watch it sometimes but because it can get a little brutal. But I, I know that I love whenever I see your trolls show up. You're worse to them than I am, George. Why are you so mean, you horrible human being? I Man, I don't know. I uh, It's really funny because 99% of the time I can control it, but... The, and you know the stand when you take so many bullets and arrows all day long, people calling you, emailing you, leaving you nasty mm. messages. Man, there's just sometimes somebody will say the minorest thing, and it's just boom. I wouldn't know anything about that. I uh, am Not well you. known for keeping my cool and and being amazingly nice to everybody. I'm well known for that, George. I know um, when they look it up in the dictionary, they see a picture of your face. Yeah, no <laughs> joke. All right. Well, on that note, uh, we appreciate you for joining us, uh, George Jarrett, joining us live from, where are you at, Walnut Ridge? Is that right? I'm just sitting in my home office right now. There you go. George Jarrett, live in Northeast Arkansas on NEA Report. 
Thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. We appreciate it. A special broadcast. Thanks to George and, and George's amazing wife, Tracy, for letting you spend a little of your time tonight for uh, for the news. We appreciate her. She, she puts up with a lot out of us, you know, so. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Have a great night. Stan Morris reporting in Jonesboro on any... <laughs>